Anyway, on November 26, 2003, just in time for Thanksgiving and nearly a full month late for Halloween, we got the first theatrical Haunted Mansion movie. Yep, this is the adaptation that looms largest until the new movie comes out, and it's generally seen as a disappointment, even by its star. I did a Haunted Mansion movie, and it didn't. It wasn't very good. <laughs> so I don't know if they want to bring the old baggage and have me <laughs> stinking up the new one. On paper, there's a lot that must have made sense in development. Don Hahn had good experiences before producing a movie about a curse that befell all the servants of a house that could only be broken by the master's true love. And Comedians in Haunted Houses is a tried and true formula. Sort of it was a, a paradigm from Bob Hope and the Ghost Breakers, and it was Don Knotts and the Ghost of Mr. Chicken and Abner and Costello meet Frankenstein. And that, those are the sort of movies where you have an ordinary, everyday show going into a haunted circumstance and just trying to get out of it any way he could. And sort of putting Eddie Murphy into that role was sort of a perfect modern, everyday uh, equivalent of those guys. At one point, they were going to honor the legacy of comedians in haunted houses so much that they were going to cast Mr. Chicken himself, Don Knotts, in this movie. Don Knotts was going to play the groundskeeper. That is the most perfect casting ever, and not just because having two separate Mayberry alum and two separate mansion adaptations would make me personally very happy. But for whatever reason, the character's not there. I don't know if Don Knotts dropped out or if just rewrites wrote him out before he even filmed, but there's no groundskeeper in the movie. Well, no living groundskeeper. There's the ghost of the groundskeeper, which seems like really missing the mark, having the one living character in the ride be just another ghost in the pile of ghosts. Look at the size of these knockers. Ever seen anything like that before? Perfect metaphor for the movie as a whole, really. Referencing a joke in an actual horror comedy without keeping the actual joke. Knockers was obviously from Young Frankenstein. Um... <laughs> Uh, anything we can take from that movie, we will. Remember this fun, silly, scary thing? Here's a watered-down piece with its aftertaste. It's hard to pinpoint exactly what went wrong here, but I don't think it's just one thing. I think it's a death by a thousand little cuts. There were some bigger miscalculations than others. You can chalk it up to family-friendly remake era Eddie Murphy is a terrible choice to lead the Haunted Mansion movie, but honestly, Eddie Murphy as a realtor trying to sell the Haunted Mansion is an even funnier idea than Phyllis Diller as the ghost host or Gilbert Gottfried in the Tower of Terror. That element would have been a great framing device for like a comedic Halloween TV special. Eddie Murphy is the realtor trying to put a positive spin on the mansion's features and that's the framing device for, like, the history of the mansion or classic spooky Disney cartoons. We don't have enough excuses to show lonesome ghosts yet. It's just not a good fit for THE Haunted Mansion movie. But that said, the movie's problems do go a little deeper. It wouldn't be fixed just by recasting the lead role. What is it? It's so, like, the son has this arc about overcoming his fears where he's got a fear of spiders and then he needs to face that fear of spiders. All your life you're gonna be facing spiders, okay? I am. What I'm trying to say is you should never be afraid. Don't be afraid of anything. I get why having an arc related to fears made sense for a Haunted Mansion movie, but I really don't think overcoming those fears is the story that the Haunted Mansion is telling you. I think accepting and learning to live with your fears would be a much better mansion moral. And the dialogue pays lip service to that idea. It's okay to get scared, alright? Everybody gets scared sometimes. It's okay to get scared. Everybody gets scared every now and then, son, but you just can't let it stop. But in practicality, the action is still about mustering up bravery in the face of the fear and not just accepting fear as a part of life, which I feel like is much closer to the story the attraction wants to tell you. But at least the sun's arc, even if it ends up at the wrong place for a mansion movie, is still kind of on theme for a mansion movie. Eddie's arc is... He's late coming home on his own anniversary because he's working on the business he shares with his wife, so, you know, a simple phone call would have taken care of everything, but instead he makes up for it by taking the family to the lake, and then he learns not to take even small detours. Like, he learns that doing any work for the business is bad, I guess. And he learns to keep trying, I guess. I tried, I failed! Try again. Okay, he learns that the only thing that breaks haunted glass is a car, for some reason. I get that it's, you know, metaphor for putting his family ahead of his belongings, but that wasn't even, like, a big character flaw of his. It was just, like, a little moment early on. Hey, Megan, don't slam the door like that. It's very sensitive. It's a car, Dad. Ah! It's not just a car. 
It's a very delicate piece of machinery. And it's such a minuscule thread of this thing that doesn't tie into the themes relevant to the mansion's story. Unless it's going for a theme of, like, letting go of earthly possessions, but it doesn't tie that super well when even the ghosts don't let go of earthly possessions. You can't take it with you. The hell I can't! <laughs> But then at the same time, there are some faithful representations of sequences from the attraction. Eddie finds most of them behind a stereotypical secret passage. There's always a sliding bookcase, you know, a trap door, a secret, a secret passage. I think it's just an homage to every, you know, haunted house movie that's been made ever. <laughs> Perfect metaphor for the movie as a whole, really. The good Haunted Mansion stuff is hidden away in there. You just got to look for it behind the bland cliche movie. The butler did it? You gotta be kidding me. And don't get me wrong, the ride is not above using horror tropes and cliches as well, but at least it presents the novelty of seeing them happen right in front of your face. Seeing cliches that aren't from the ride happen in the movie just makes me wonder, why am I watching this movie instead of the hundreds of others I've seen this scene in? This scene actually was not uh, shot in the original photography. It was something that we added after we had cut the movie together, we realized that Somehow Eddie was missing through part of the movie. So we uh, surprisingly created the set, which was really the closest homage we paid to the ride. It's very much out of the ride at Disneyland. Uh, and it wasn't really there in the original conception of the movie. So it's there because they needed scenes with Eddie Murphy, but they didn't come up organically in the story. Both Eddie Murphy and the iconography of the Haunted Mansion are largely superfluous in the Haunted Mansion movie. So when your most faithful translation of attraction scene to movie scene is only there because they realized the plot didn't give their alleged main character anything to do, that's a sign that your movie's problems go deeper than just it's not doing enough from the ride. A better execution of the Mansion fan service might have made more Mansion nerds enjoy the film, but that alone wouldn't have made it resonate with a wider audience. The success of the first Pirates movie eclipsed the popularity of the source material in popular culture. Yes, it happened to be a good Pirates adaptation, but it was also just a fun movie people liked even if they had never heard of the ride. And I don't know what could have been changed to make this movie appeal to a wider audience because nobody knows anything, but there were real easy ways to make this appeal more to Mansion fans at the very least. Like, leaving the mansion haunted at the end for one. Bye -bye. That feels like a change that was made in effort to appeal to a wider audience, but it didn't really work. Some of the fan service is effective, and some just comes so close but doesn't quite get there. The storm has flooded the road. I'm afraid there will be no leaving the mansion tonight. I'm afraid there's no other way. Just say there's no turning back now! You're dancing around it, just say it! Even after the misguided ending, the movie ends with botched fan service by having Leota and the bus in the car, because it's not like there are any prominent characters in the mansion specifically associated with hitchhiking you could have used here. We don't know for a fact that the hitchhiking ghosts were part of the ghosts who went to heaven. They could still be around. If the bus are still around, who knows? But at least the fan service in the post credit scene mostly works. Hurry back, be sure to bring your death certificate. If you decide to join us, make your final arrangements now. We've been dying to have you. <laughs> yeah, that line read worked. Tilly is a much better fit for little Leota than for Madame Leota. One of the many things that worked about the first Pirates movie is that the fan service was actually woven organically into the story. Every recreation of a ride tableau happens for about a second in a scene that the story set up anyway. Main characters in jail? Throw in the dog scene. A character's drunk? Have him sleeping with the pigs. But here... The scenes from the ride are detours that distract from the goal. Look, it's the singing busts! Only four of them, and none with Thurl's voice, even though I don't think Thurl was retired at this point. It would have been a great vocal cameo. They put in his face, but not his voice, and that just seems wrong. But it's Dapper Dan's. You like them. They're a Disneyland thing. Oh, in Dixie. Dad, there oh, it is. Thanks. Okay, never mind, the plot's over here, that was just a distraction. The biggest fan service sequence in the entire movie is just kind of breezed through. It's going to take up probably about two minutes in the film as one continuous shot, even though we're shooting it over many days. All that work, all that effort, all that care and love and respect for the iconography of the ride, just kind of there. The artistry behind the technology really gives us the ability to take original ideas from the ride, anywhere from Madame Leota, 
to the ghosts flying up around, to stars in the sky, and really take that to another level where it feels three-dimensional. You know what else feels three-dimensional? Riding the ride. The only characters from the ride who are actually part of the story and not just mild distractions are Madame Leota and Master Gracie, who's not really so much a character from the ride as it is a name from the queue. Keep in mind that uh, the original plan was that Master Gracie was supposed to be a dead child, not the master of the house. I am Madame Leota. Of all. But Madame Leota's main goal just seems to be sending them on fetch quests. Enter the tomb under the great dead oak and travel down deep under the ground. And there you will find the key that must be found. Find the black crypt that bears no name or soon your fate will be the same. Let me guess, you're gonna get to the end of the crypt and then Goofy gives you the key. But originally the hitchhiking ghosts were gonna be part of the story. They were gonna be the main ghosts who help everyone out. But then in rewrites, they just turned them into servants. So that's why Ezra, instead of being hitchhiking ghost Ezra, is now Wallace Shawn. And instead of the other two ghosts, we have his wife, Emma, who is played by the other, other actress who played Fraser's ex-wife, Nanny G. I dreamt that I was riding I'm not trying to work the Cheers universe into every single video, it just keeps coming up. The movie's also just not very funny. I mean, Eddie Murphy is a great comedic performer and he's got comedic delivery, but the words he's saying just aren't that funny. And I know that's subjective, maybe you do think it's funny and fair enough, but even if it is funny, it's just not a tonal fit for the Haunted Mansion. And like I said earlier, the humor of Phyllis Diller is not really a tonal fit for the Haunted Mansion, but at least the jokes they gave her were tonal fits, even if the delivery wasn't. Here it's just not really Haunted Mansion type jokes. It's deflating the mansion. In the ride, the humor works with the scares. The humor lowers your guard to make the scares hit harder, and then the scares lower your guard to make the humor hit harder. But they work together. Even when the jokes are about the mansion and its peculiarities, the target of the joke is you, the living, and your discomfort with it. The jokes are made by the comfortable because of their amusement with those who are uncomfortable. Here, Maybe Jim Evers is using humor as a defense mechanism against his fear, and that's not inherently bad, but it is not the mansion's sense of humor. The jokes here all come from the uncomfortable, making fun of the mansion to try to assuage their discomfort, not from the comfortable, amused by the discomfort. Neither approach to humor is inherently better or worse than the other, they just aren't the same styles of humor, so if your goal is to adapt the haunted mansion, it helps to understand the mansion's sense of humor. In fact, the very best joke in this movie is just in the director's commentary. This is uh, Jennifer Tilly's head. Um, I actually got to work with Jennifer Tilly's voice on Stuart Little and graduated to her head on this picture. I'm looking forward to the opportunity to work with her whole body uh, soon. I also hate to ask questions like this in movies with fantastical elements, but... I do not understand the rules here. I don't make the rules, okay? I just work here. So Leota is the only one who knows things, but she doesn't control anything. She is part of a separate haunted magic than the ghost magic, but she didn't put the curse on the house. That's just unseen forces. But she does know about the curse and she has answers about the curse. But she doesn't know everything because she can't just break the curse herself. She has to just talk in riddles, I guess. And Ramsley, for some reason, thinks that his plan will break the curse that he's definitely responsible for, but he's really convinced that continuing to do things his way is also the solution to the mess that he got himself in. I mean, okay, that's just the character flaw of ego, I guess, but he thinks he's got a grasp on these rules that the audience definitely does not have a grasp on. Well, damn you. Damn you, Lord. So then Ramsley summons the Hell Demons, but they turn out to be his own undoing, just like Pete unleashing the hitchhiking ghosts, and once again, Eddie is superfluous in his own movie, but what was he trying to do there, and why did he think it would work? So the singing bus are also haunted by a different magic than the rest of the house, because they also didn't go to heaven, and that's fine, but like, why have most of the ghosts under one particular curse, but then there's just also additional haunted stuff that is 
never explained even as little as the original curse is explained, and if the story was more compelling, I wouldn't mind the vagueness behind the rules. I don't know the rules in the mansion itself, I just know there's ghosts, and they like being here. And I don't need to know the rules, but you're presenting just a few too many rules for me to be comfortable not knowing the rest of them. Part of the magic of the original ride is that the disparate flavors from different artists all come together and blend into a tone all of its own. The spookiness of Claude Coates and the goofiness of Mark Davis aren't intrinsically compatible, but they work together to craft the mansion's own distinct identity. And unfortunately, the disparate flavors that went into this movie do not blend nearly as seamlessly. This film was made by talented people, and it's clear that Rick Baker especially really wanted to do the mansion justice. He cast himself as the hatchet man. I wanted to stay true to the feeling of the ride because I'm a big fan of the ride. This is very much the drawing that Mark Davis did. Give that makeup to a walk-around character at Mickey's Not So Scary and Oogie Boogie Bash. I dare you! Nobody here wanted to make a bad Haunted Mansion movie, but for whatever reason, whether it was misguided creative decisions or just mandates from corporate, the story they settled on did not do the mansion justice. But hey, it still gives me more of what I want from the mansion than that stupid sing-along, so that's the bar we're clearing here. Ultimately, it's a meshing of disparate ideas that all make sense separately and might even make sense on paper together, but they just don't quite congeal. There is a lot to like in it, but despite being the most prominent adaptation thus far, it certainly isn't worthy of being the definitive Haunted Mansion adaptation. That said, there are people younger than me who grew up with this movie and loved it. It was one of their first exposures to horror comedy, and it got them interested in the spooky and the silly the exact same way the ride would for people their age. So I guess for kids, it can be an effective companion to the ride. There still could have been much better ways to implement this ride to a film, and I hope we're about to see one, but if this movie worked for you as a kid, I'm happy for you. There is also a bunch of stuff to promote the movie. There was a DVD feature that claims to be a virtual ride, but it's really just a tour of the movie sets with new footage of Ezra and Emma. Neat DVD feature, it's nice that they got more Wallace Shawn for this, but it's pretty far removed from the ride, especially when the title makes it sound like it's going to be a virtual ride through of the original mansion. There are also two music videos connected to this movie. The one on the DVD is for the song that's not in the movie, Raven Simone's cover of Stevie Wonder's Superstition. A cover which samples just a little bit of Grim Grinning Ghosts. In this music video, Raven and her friends are green screened into the exterior of the movie's mansion for a surprise party. They dance on the sets of the movie and are apparently scared by fog, I guess? Okay, all right, y'all, no more surprise parties. Uh -uh. Yeah, no, 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 no. No. Then there's the Nelly video, the song that is in the credits of the movie, even though it wasn't written for the movie, Is You, which samples the People's Court theme. Yep. Nelly is green screened into the exterior of the mansion because he inherited it from his uncle. They go inside and it's neither the interiors from the movie nor the ride, but it's still haunted in ways that have nothing to do with the movie or the ride. So the cover song that's not in the movie uses the sets from the movie, and the song that wasn't written for the movie but is in the credits has a video based on the movie that doesn't use the sets from the movie and is not included on the DVD. Good, I wasn't confused enough yet. And we're not quite done with the movie continuity yet because it continued in comics in Disney Adventures magazine. The December 2003 issue plugged the mansion movie hard, featuring an interview with the kids from the movie, a closer look at a few of the ghosts, and a comic. Scans of the comic can be found on the Mansion Fandom Wiki, but I bought a copy off eBay myself to see if there was anything interesting in the BTS info. There wasn't really, but um, it is very funny that the cover places the Mansion movie side by side with a slightly smaller showcase of a movie that would go on to win 11 Oscars. And it's funny that ordering this on eBay cost me a spooky $13.13! .13. The comic in this issue is called Cookie Creeps, about young twins named Ty and Madison selling cookies for a school trip. And Madison wants to sell cookies at Gracie Manor, even though Ty's too scared. Well, until he sees the suits of armor and can quote Holy Grail, and then he just barely avoids getting hit by a knight. Ezra and Emma find the kids, and then a scary ghost starts chasing them. The ghosts chase Madison into the secret passageway while Emma and Ezra escort Ty outside. Madison skips the fan service hallway and goes straight to Jennifer Tilly, who doesn't really contribute much because Emma and Ezra immediately usher Madison outside again, just in the nick of time as the scary ghost shows up. Meanwhile, Ty's outside and runs into the singing bus, who are just as unhelpful as they are in the movie. 
but at least Ty got over his fears long enough to befriend the singing bus while Madison is filled with new fears. And they escape the mansion with Madison vowing never to sell cookies again. Much to the scary ghost chagrin. He just wanted a cookie! Wah, 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 wah. Trespassers don't get cookies! Then there was another mansion comic in the winter 2004 Comic Zone issue of Disney Adventures called Monster Makeover. Unfortunately, the Mansion Fandom Wiki only has scans of two pages of the comic, and it considers the rest to be lost media. Fortunately, eBay still exists. Yeah, I scanned it. Links in the description. The crew of Space Extreme, TV's most extreme home decorating show, arrives at Gracie Manor. A crew consisting of the host, Phil, the producer, Rita, and the cameraman, Larry. And his camera that he calls Tony. So I guess in this case, some jerk is the camera. The crew barges in uninvited, which annoys Ramsley, but he takes the opportunity to mess with them. Given that this was the extreme early 2000s, Phil begins redecorating by... Sledgehammering paint everywhere. And a ghost sneaks up on him, and Larry tries to warn him, but another ghost trips Larry into the paint. Later, Phil tries to get rid of the old junk in the mansion, like Madame Leota. Just trying to get rid of the old junk that's actually in the haunted mansion. Are we sure Phil didn't produce the movie? So Leota summons ghosts to mess with them, Phil doesn't take responsibility, Larry tries to escape, but Ramsley is not done torturing the crew. So he gives them a taste of the zombie mausoleum. And that's the last straw. So the crew escapes into the night, and Ramsley's satisfied until he sees that their damage is already done. They put a skateboard ramp in the ballroom! Wah, 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 wah. These comics are... cute, I guess? The artwork is decent, and the premises are fine. I just don't think the jokes in them are very funny, but it is interesting that they try to blend the ride sense of humor with the movies, having some jokes deflate the mansion and some deflate its intruders. The important thing about these comics, though, is that the premise of kids selling cookies in the mansion and the premise of a home renovation show entering the mansion are both exactly as funny as the premise of Eddie Murphy as a realtor trying to sell the mansion. Your big budget movie was built on a back phone about as strong as a Disney Adventures comic premise. So hurry back, we would like your company.